Well, welcome. This is State Senator Gerald Neal, and welcome to Straight Talk. Uh, I want you to know that as we go through this, uh, one, once again, I would ask you to share this with your friends uh, and to make sure that we have this go as far as it possibly can. Um, uh, I have a very special, special interaction today as we discuss unique perspectives from individuals who are on the front line, individuals who are involved in the protest movement today. And I guess you could add to it, we have an intergenerational flair with respect to this. And I'm probably the one that creates the intergenerational nature of this presentation today, uh, because I have some uh, very, very involved, very dedicated and, and very focused young folk that are involved uh, in this particular rendition of Straight Talk. Uh, before we go there, I do want to say that, uh, as we all know, that we lost a, an icon uh, yesterday, uh, John Lewis. Uh, who does not know that name, John Lewis, and what he has meant to all of us and what he's meant to the United States of America, the civil rights movement, the voter rights movement, the human rights movement, you name a movement, John Lewis personifies that. At the end of this uh, event, uh, I will offer a tribute uh, in that particular regard. But until then, I am delighted to have uh, individuals with me today that are, are right out there on the front line. They personify uh, what back in the day we would say, uh, these are the people that were making it happen. These are the people that are laying the foundation for change. These are the people who are driving the movement. And, you know, uh, someone in, in my age group probably would look at them. I can now see how older folks may have perceived us back then when we were doing civil rights movement. And they probably say, what are they doing? It's a confusion. Who are these people, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? We saw ourselves as ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And guess what I have found out? I have found out we have some extraordinary people doing ordinary things and ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So let's not hear from me so much. Let's hear from them. So we have from us, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start uh, by one and ask each of them to give us just a little brief uh, indication of who they are with respect to uh, uh, what they're doing now, et cetera. I'll start with uh, Charlize Montgomery. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Charlize Montgomery. My role within the city of Louisville, I serve as um, the vice president of operations for the Louisville Urban League Young Professionals. Um, so I serve in that capacity for, the, for our city here in Louisville. As well, um, I call myself a community in engager, um, community engagement specialist to where I engage with other groups um, like my friends who are here to make sure that they're connected with other organizations on their needs and to offer support within um, their protests or just serving uh, within the community of Louisville, so. We also, thank you, Charlize. We also have with us Delaney Haley. Delaney? Hi, my name is Delaney Haley. I am one of the founders of No Justice, No Peace Louisville. And um, we've been frontline protesting. Um, we've been doing the large car caravans that have gone out to like every area of Louisville. Um, we put on a Juneteenth Fest at the waterfront, um, which garnered a lot of um, community support and everything. And we most recently did um, the big mural down on Main Street with Breonna Taylor, David McAtee, Sandra Bland, and a couple of other faces that were lost at the hands of police brutality. And we also did the shutdown at the soccer stadium as well. Thank, thank you, Delaney. Uh, uh, Elliot Kelly, how are you? Yes, I'm doing well. How about you? Uh, appreciate you for having me on. Uh, my name is Elliot Kelly Jr. I'm from Louisville, a member of No Justice, No Peace Louisville. And I've been on the front lines protesting since the protests started happening. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that's my only contribution. I also educate youth in the community as well. I would say that's more so what I, uh, lately I've been more so on the front lines just because that's what is, that's what the dominant presence is right now. But around the clock, what I, what I normally do, uh, passion of mine is educating young people, just educating everybody around me on 
uh, what the movement is, what oppression looks like in its many different forms and how to overcome that oppression from an individual standpoint as a person of color. And I see you have with you uh, Adia, Adia Young. Hi, uh, my name is Adia. I am a recent Spelman College graduate, Louisville native. I am also one of the leaders of No Justice, No Peace Louisville. And just like everyone else, I've been doing my part um, on the front lines, helping to organize and educate people and trying to pull my weight in all of this. I also work on the legal team for a tech company. So I contribute, I guess, in many ways. And like Elliot said, um, throughout my lifestyle, what I'm involved with, who I interact with in the circles I involve myself in as well. Okay, and last but not least, we have Talisha Wilson. Hi, Talisha. Hey, um, so like I told you, I'm doing my hair, so my, my video is off, but- um, You have rights, don't worry about yes, it. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Talisha Wilson, or Tala, either one is fine. Um, I am the director and the founder of Diversity at the Table, which is a uh, community organization that discusses the intersections between gender, race, class, and sexuality, and how those things relate to social issues. I also am the director of the of community engagement for Change Today, Change Tomorrow. I serve on the board, uh, and that is the initiative, that uh, that is the organization that um, started the initiative with Feed the West. Um, and then I uh, also am uh, a part of Black Lives Matter Louisville. Um, and uh, I am a community organizer. I've been organizing uh, for about six years, but I've been an activist for about 10 years. Um, went to UofL, graduated from UofL 2016, Women and Gender Studies, Pan-African Studies. Um, what else? Uh, I wear many hats, but Recently, I've been hosting um, the direct action trainings. Um, in the last 40 plus days, I've had, I wanna say 13 uh, trainings and we have uh, plenty more to go and that's who I am. Well, okay, well, thank you, I appreciate that. Well, why don't, why don't we just dive right into it? I mean, uh, I guess part of what we're trying to do here is get folks to meet and know you, what you're thinking, what you see, what's motivating you, that sort of thing. But uh, what, what is it, what's this moving about to you? I mean, and I'll tell you what, let, let me start with, I'm gonna start with Delaney with respect to this. And I want you all to just chime in as you see fit. And, 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 and don't try to not say something cause I'm gonna find you. I got you on my screen. <laughs> okay, Delaney, would you start, start us out? What's this moving about? So this movement to me is about just overall justice and equality. Um, I feel like there have been so many recent injustices taking place. And if you look back to it, um, I think we saw a big sort of beginning of the movement about four years ago. I think there was kind of a shift where people started getting on board with the movement. And I think now with the recent killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, um, more people have gotten on board um, and, and are starting to realize that this is really a big issue in the United States with police brutality, with um, you know just unjust killings at the hands of police. And this movement for me is about fighting against that and you know seeing the change that is so needed right now, um, not only just with you know within the police force, but within other levels of government as well. Time in. Um, so for me, this movement is, yes, about the injustices we face, but it's also about Black liberation. To me, this movement is about changing people's mindsets, the way we perceive the world, and being open to allowing different things. Um, so I think, to me, it's about dismantling systems, rebuilding them, dismantling people's spirit, mindsets, and misperceptions, and changing the way we view the world. And I think it's overall just about changing how we operate as human beings and how we treat each other and how we look at humanity and all. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with Adia on that and also uh, Delaney. Um, for me, it's about ultimate freedom, right? And it's about ultimate freedom for black people and other marginalized people. Um, and I know that there's a large focus on police brutality and that is a really, really huge part of 
this movement, but there's also so many things that contribute to black people not being able to be free. You know, we have housing issues, we have gender issues, we have queer issues. There's so many issues that are involved with black people not being able to have that freedom, not being able to um, have the resources and the access to things that other people have uh, because of the disadvantages that we have versus the advantages that other people have. So for me, it's about making sure that we're free on all spectrums. Like, why is the police killing us? Well, it has to do with also the fact how much money they're getting and how can we start having conversations about defunding police, but also defunding a lot of these corporate organizations that put us in cages and kind of bind us to be uh, exactly where we are with them and not allowing us room to grow and be our creative selves. Well, I, I'm hearing this before you, before you chime in, uh, I, I'm hearing that it's not one dimensional. There's many dimensions to this piece. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Um, and, and I'm also hearing that uh, that Although the Breonna Taylor piece, the George Floyd piece, these tragic murders took place and, and uh, now it seems like an explosion of protests. Yes. Sir. This really started before this. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. exactly. So, so the thing is, uh, that was, so they were the catalyst for the large amount of protests now, but the seeds have been plenty for generations, the seeds have been planted for centuries. And the thing, uh, really at the inception of this nation, the seeds were planted. We as uh, people of color come from a long a long line of revolutionaries. And that doesn't just look like protests in uh, daily resistance. It also looks like, um, it also looks like those seeking economic empowerment for the black community, uh, addressing the educational inequities. For example, our kids going to schools every day, we're not reflecting in the curriculums. Uh, you can't leave out the economic pieces, Talisha said, because, um, Social justice and economic empowerment are directly related between the FHA acts of the uh, early 30s and white flight in the late 60s. Uh, all of these different things throughout the history of our city and throughout the history of our nation and even the world, you know, it's um, the seeds have been planted. The seeds have been planted for a revolution. And the thing is, the uh, George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, these were they were just a catalyst. They were just, the, they were the straw that broke the camel's back and made us say, damn it, enough is enough. And that's, that's simply what that was. But the seeds have been planted for centuries. Well, Charlize, you come from a well-known, you're working with a well-known organization, a, a revered organization, an organization that does substantive day-to-day -day work down in the trenches uh, in our, our community. Uh, what brings you out? For me, um, it's about tearing those systems down. Like you all had said, um, these things have been planted for years, generations, to your generation, uh, Senator Neal, and before then, um, we're just the next one to carry the mantle on um, because it has to stop um, in order for the generation that comes behind us to not have to deal with these same problems when they get 20 and 30 and 40 years old. Um, and so we are here to make a stop and make an impact and, and say that enough is enough um, and the change has to happen now in order for us to be able to see the seed that was planted 60 years ago to flourish into what it should be now. Well, I, I, I tell you, um, someone looking at what's on TV, uh, they may say, well, what's going on there? What's, what's this chaos? What, you know, they see uh, instances of nonviolence. They see instances of violence. And sometimes you don't know who's doing what or why. Can, can you all make some sense of who's out there? And, and what I would like for you to do, if you would, is start at the beginning of it. And that was immediately, I'm saying, after uh, the Brianna Taylor uh, uh, killing. But after that, it seems to evolve a little bit, or at least it, it seems to have a little more order to it. Could someone speak to that? Um, I'll speak to that, uh, and of course others can as well. But for me, um, I, for one, I think that the media is corrupted, especially the the uh, mainstream media. I believe is corrupted. Um, so a lot of things that people see, unless you're out there, you're not going to know exactly what's going on. But also, there's a lot of things that are not being seen, and that's the way that it's supposed to happen to happen. So people are like, what's going on? Well, you're not supposed to know what's going on because when people know what's going on, it ends up being infiltrated. You end up having agitators in your space who are really uh, there and are, are ultimately there to 
get you out of character to, you know, that are planted there to make the movement something else. And so the, the good things that are happening, the organizing that is happening, people are not seeing because it's not meant for you to see anyway. It's meant for you to be involved in. Whoa. So I'm doing yeah. a lot. Of, I, I'm doing a lot of things with a lot of people in the city and I'm seeing a lot of numbers. There's in my last training, there was so many people in the one before that there was even more. I mean, there's a large amount of people who are out here really organizing, really doing this work, really making sure that the things that we're doing is effective and is going to create some type of change, whether it is getting people's emotions out and it's just like expressing their anger or kind of like what we did at the ribbon cutting, it was just a small thing to say, hey, wait a minute, Mayor Fisher, you thought that we had let, uh, you thought that we were done with you, but we're really not. So we just want to let you know that when you're doing these things, when you're existing in life, you don't get to exist as a free person because we're not free. Even in our homes, we're not free. So there's a large amount of people who are organizing in that way. And I don't know if you are on the call. I know most of you on the call have seen the video, but you know, people were really applauding it because it was so organized and it was so strategic. And those things are happening. Those type of conversations are happening. Those organizing skills are being put in place so that not only are we getting our point across, but we're making sure that everyone around us is safe and making sure that everyone around us has purpose. Because my biggest thing also is making sure that when people are out there organizing, that everyone knows why they are doing it. I think that a lot of people are out there screaming and shouting and why I don't dismiss that. And I think that is important. I also think that it is equally important to know why you are doing it, not just for us to commune with each other because we've been stuck in the house. We want to uh, been stuck in the house for months and months at a time because of COVID, but also because this is about my life. This is about my children's life who I plan to have in the future and about my siblings and about my friends and my family who I love so much. So, so we're you, organizing, it's happening. Outstanding. What what are some of the other views are pitch in? I was just gonna say um, to mimic to what Tyler had to say. I think it's also important that when we hear that that negative talk, that we change the narrative, that we don't just run with what somebody has to say, oh, I heard they were doing this. No find out for yourself and, and, and report to or ask any of us who are there on the ground, not just run with what you hear, but change the conversation, treat it like it's your own. It, would you want somebody else to say these things about you when you know that that's not what's happening and making sure that those conversations, are, the negative don't continue on. That's the issue that I sometimes have. And these negative seeds are spread about different organizations that are always not true when a person could say no i know this to be truth and i know that this is a lie so let's you know stopping that but go ahead you all i was gonna um chime off also what tala said i completely agree that like depending on where you're getting your information from the media the perspective will change and the narrative will change depending on the perspective so whether you're getting it from facebook lives from mainstream media whatever the case may be the perspective of the narrative is going to vary based on how you're receiving that news. And also, I don't think it's really, in my opinion, important to, or important to focus on or discredit like organization versus disorganization because during the civil rights movement, any revolutionary movement, there's always gonna be sporadic groups of disorganization. There's always gonna be crowds or groups or things you can't control, but that's not the focus of the narrative. And that's not the focus of the movement, the ideas that we're getting the message out here, that we're having the correct approach and that we're all on the same page and on one accord. So although organization is definitely important, it's important not to focus the narrative on that, for sure. So, so Delaney, uh, Delaney, uh, chime in on that, but I also want you to deal with who actually is out there. I noticed that the demographics of who was out there on the street was a lot different from the days when I was on the front line with others. Uh, the, the mix of white and black youth seems to be demonstratively different. If you would address that also, and, Kel and, and, and Elliot, if you'd follow up on that. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we're definitely seeing a lot more white folks out there with us than, you know, you may have seen in the, 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 the pre-civil uh, pre era movement. Um, 
like I said, it's it's been kind of mind blowing to me to see white folks who are on board and who are actually on board for the right reasons, who have been doing the research, who have been doing kind of like the um, organizing as well, and who have kind of just been following the lead and saying like, hey, you know, we don't really understand what you guys may be going through, but we are here to be of support in any way that we can be of support for you. And um, that's, I've seen all races. I've seen whites, I've seen blacks, I've seen, you know, Latinx out there. And that's kind of been um, just really wonderful to see. But, but who are these people? I mean, are they, they, they do the same thing you do. Are they just like you? Or, <laughs> I mean, they just have a normal life and all of a sudden they see this problem. They say, hey, I got to come out there. So what, what I, is this? So what I think it is, um, I think, I think it speaks to the intersectionality of the movement and the narrative that we're painting right now, because I think above our lefts, uh, yes, yes, it's, yes, the center of this movement is black people, but at the same time, the bigger picture, as Talisha already uh, alluded to, is just the liberation of all oppressed people. That's black people. That's women because of our patriarchal society. That's the queer community. That's the LGBTQ community, trans, transgender people, gender non-conforming people, because we live in a, a heterosexually dominant society. So anybody who knows what it feels like to be oppressed right now is angry, is upset, is looking for liberation. For is looking for that liberation. So I think that's the biggest thing right now. Yes, it's focusing on black lives because this this nation was built on a black. Society built on the backs of black people. But I think the influx of other races and other identities that you're seeing within the movement, uh, I think it just speaks to the intersectionality of the movement. I think it speaks to the true power of what we really want. And that's not just liberation of black people because that is a priority of mine personally as a black man, but it's not just the liberation of black people. The entire movement is about the liberation of all oppressed peoples. That's restoring the voices of those who have had the voice is stripped for centuries. That's restoring the power to those who have been deemed powerless for centuries, who really have so much power and is us reclaiming that power as oppressed peoples. And that's what it is. It speaks to the intersectionality of the movement above all else. Well, again, again, I'm saying that this is not one dimensional. Uh, use the term intersectionality. Uh, it has many facets, many inputs, puts, uh, many motivations, but all of it leads back to injustices and forms of oppression and a, an expression of enough's enough. That's what it sounds like to me. So they all sort of what, converged? They all came together and somebody called somebody or somebody just showed up? What happened? Uh, Shalice, tell me, tell me what's going on. Delaney, y'all tell me. Yeah, like, I mean, I think that just everybody's kind of standing together. Like Elliot was saying, it's not only just for everyone who's oppressed, it's also just you know, I've seen a lot of doctors out there. I've seen a lot of lawyers out there. I've seen a lot of people who are out there who are just saying, we want to be out here. We want to fight together. We want to fight next to you. We want to fight with you. We want to fight for you. And um, I guess everyone's just kind of coming together within their own rights. Um, you see a lot of groups, like you, like I said, back to the whole doctor thing, you saw the white coats for Black lives. And then you've just seen everyone kind of come together just in different ways to kind of just, I guess, contribute their part. Elise? I was just going to say just simple. I think people do have morals and they realize what they stand for. And for so long, they've been scared to, because of their job, to say anything. But we live in a world now to where our voices can be heard from our positions, from our corporate seats, that we can stand up to say something and, and not lose our jobs and not worry about losing our jobs. And so that has played a big piece. Um, I feel like before and times before, people may have been afraid because, oh, if I speak out and say anything, this may have some reactionary causes to me, but I, had to, I don't use that word. We don't really give a damn at this point. Um, you know, we're going to put this on the line if we have to, um, because it means more than just me and more than just our names. So that's how I, how I feel. Well, I, got, I have to tell you something. I was, I was at the, an eye doctor. I won't name him at this point. Um, getting my eyes checked and he was going through his movements on my eyes and had his assistant in the room. I think I've told this story before, but it, it still <laughs> resonates with me. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out about my eyes. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, just as he's completing this examination, he says, that was murder. Now here, this is a white guy with George Bush on his office <laughs> wall. And I said, what? I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. He said, that was murder. Genteel, nice guy, you know, boom. I said, what was murder? He said, what that cop did up in Minneapolis was murder. 
and it struck me. We proceeded, me in that chair, to have a 10-minute conversation I've never had with this white man living in his world. I'm over in my world like that, and his assistant, white assistant behind him, I could see out of the corner of my eye shaking his head, her head, you know. I mean, what that told me, I, I, I've thought about that a lot because it seemed like it hit a card, it hit a card in places I did not expect it. What have you seen that's out there that's different in terms of what happened in the beginning that now you are aware of in terms of people who you don't normally see on the front line, you don't see them fighting these kind of struggles, they don't put their bodies in the way, but you are convinced it's made a change in terms of how they are perceiving injustice in our community. Does anybody have any perspective on that? Try it. Does that mean you don't have a perspective on that? Is that a tough one? Go ahead. Um, so I think you're just you're just asking sort of like um, how white people are kind of getting more on board with it, and you know seeing what you know has kind of been. I don't want to say it's been kind of like buried, but I think because so many injustices have been taking place so publicly. And I think that certain white people are starting to see that more. I think they're starting to just be like, you know, we have to do something too. Um, one of my favorite sayings is like, white silence is violence because I feel like the white people, if they're not speaking out on the issues also, that they're being complicit to what's going on, that they are contributing to the issues, um, that they are contributing to the slaughter of black people and oppressed people. So I think you see a lot more white people standing up and speaking out now because they are starting to see firsthand that this is a huge, huge, huge issue. And we need to take our voices and start speaking up and start getting into those spaces and start getting on board with what um, is taking place right now in the world. Anybody else have a perspective on that? I yes. Guess. Oh, oh, sorry, Tom, you got it. Um, I was just going to say, like, no matter what my personal feelings are as it pertains to the intelligence of white folks, I know that they're, white folks are not too dumb to understand that Black people are the reason for everything in this whole entire world. And that literally, without us, literally, white folks can't accomplish anything. And so for a very long time, white people have ignored that, right? So that's been in place all our lives that we literally move the world. We make the world happen. We created this world. We created life. And I think that noun is a little different because they can't escape it. Like they can't escape it. For so long, white people have been able to hide behind us and still reap the benefits of what it is that we bring to the table. But now it's very, it's very hard and it's close to impossible to accomplish something because of the help of, white, uh, of black folks and not be able to speak up about that, not be able to give us, you know what I'm saying, our credit that we deserve. You know what I mean? Like, it's very hard for white people to ignore that we make this world move. So I think that that is why white people are involved. A little bit of it is self-serving, but a lot of it is like, Dean, uh, uh, the reality is that we can't do anything. I can't create anything. I can't accomplish anything without the support of these people. So even if even if this is like this, this is me just being kind of a jerk, but like Nike, who gonna, who gonna buy your clothes if, if we all did? Mm. Honestly, like who is going to buy all your clothes, Gucci, if we die? What happens to you? You have nothing. If we're all gone. Well, let me ask you a question, Talisha. Yeah, the let me ask you a question. Let me mm -hmm. ask you a question, though. I, I, I don't doubt uh, what you're saying, but don't you think some white folks have something that pricks their conscience because they see themselves as moral beings, that they can't I look at this once that once their comfort has been invaded, how, how do you respond to that? No, I do that's believe not, that's that not that a material piece there. That, yeah, that I is, do believe it goes to the core of who are. you are, right? 
Yeah, I believe that some people are, but we have to acknowledge the fact that there is no point in black, I mean, white people's lives where they have to acknowledge racism. There's no point in their life where they have to acknowledge racism until it has to, until it, it interferes with them in their life, in their livelihood, in their their assets, in their money. I get it. Someone so else. like, yeah. while yeah. I believe that some people, are, that some white folks are like, really, I love I just care about people and I care about the well-being of people. I do believe that there is a number of white folks who believe that and who feel that way. But okay. there's they don't have to be uncomfortable. They don't have to live a life of discomfort. So anything that they do has to be an in, in, intentional thing. And I think it's the intentionality that we have to focus on like, why are you here? And what motivated you to be here and what, what made you have to think that black people are good people? Because you don't have to think that. You're not ever in a space where you have to acknowledge my blackness, that you have to acknowledge that I exist, that you have to, to do anything as it pertains to me or care about my life or my livelihood. That is not something that you have to do. So what changed? I'm very curious about what was that? Well, I'll tell you what. Let, let, let... Who else has a, a, a point to make on that? Uh, just just pile on in. Now, she, she's raised a lot of points there, but something I get out of that also is that there's a duality in this piece. You know, you, you, you want support, you want involvement, but at the same time, it's come so late or it's come so begrudgingly that you, you, you have to question why are they there? I mean, that's, there's a kind of a psychological dilemma, if not a real dilemma, with respect to that, what's, what's anyone has a insights into so, that? So I think it's um, one of two things, actually a combination of two things. One sort of what's all I said, I think at this point, allies, whether white or from other races or whatever the case may be, I think they're honestly sick of seeing us fighting the same fight. And people who were once originally on the fence are now like, okay, at this point, it's been generations, it's been so long. Let me voice, like, you know, let me go ahead and step over the line and do my part and play a role or whatever the case may be. I think secondly as well, we're in the age of technology and social media. So I think a lot of things are very amplified right now and you can vividly see people's support or lack thereof for a specific movement. And I think now with how our, like my, me and Elliot, Elliot and I's generation is, um, we're very technological savvy and we're getting into media and things like that. And so at this point, kind of alluding to Salah's point as well, you no longer can hourly not support black people and still have our support. It's like, we're doing our research. If you're not explicitly expressing your support of us, you're losing a lot of support from our community. And I think also as well, um, it's vivid. Like people's support or lack thereof is, is pretty clear. It's no more like you can hop behind walls and you can ignore the conversation. It's there, there's social media, there's the internet, there's technology, it's in your face and there's really no way to avoid the conversation. So it's kind of like you pick a side and it's made very clear and distinct. Wow, what, what, what is your age group, you and, you and Elliot? I'm 22 and Elliot's 21. Okay, what, what about you, Shalise? If you don't mind. I'm, I'm 36, yes. <laughs> okay, Delaney? I'm sorry, you, you're on mute. I'm in my later 20s. Okay, later 20s, I love that. <laughs> and I'm 27. Oh, 27. And, I, and, and I'm, in, I'm in my later 30s, if you want to believe that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. Let's, 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 let's get right into the, the guts of this thing, the police. You know, here is a truism. Everyone needs security in their community. There's no question about that. I mean, if somebody breaks in my house or your house, who are you going to call? You know, you're going to call the police. And the fact of the matter is, we need the police. At the same time, the police are there for ostensibly for certain reasons to protect and serve. And for them to do that, they need what? They need the community. And yet, what do we see in our community? A, a gross distrust, particularly of African Americans and other communities of color, of the police. And we know the historical piece behind that. And you can get into it if you want to. But what I'm really trying to get into is what's really happening on the ground. 
I, I, I keep raising this question, why are they using force the way they are? I understand that there are some people out there that were doing some um, some things that you might call some bad things, breaking the law, breaking out windows or something like that. I, I, you know, I don't support that. I assume you don't either. But there are people that were peacefully demonstrating and using force against them raises a serious question in my mind. What, just just pile on. Tell me, tell me what hap what was really happening on the streets. You were there. What was happening? Why are the police think, using this force? Was it excessive? Was it? I'd like to speak to that if possible. Yes. Um, so one night in particular, it was when the protesting first began and it got pretty heated downtown at the square. Um, I don't acknowledge it as Jefferson Square anymore. I'll just call it the square, Rihanna Circle or wherever you want to call it, um, whatever you decide to call it. And we were all peacefully protesting. Um, we were kind of standing our ground and it was just, it seemed almost out of nowhere that like police in full riot gear started just moving in on us, moving in on us, moving in on us. And- um, Were you blocking the street or something on this occasion? Um, we were in the street, we were just kind of in different areas. But at this point, I don't even think that we'd really block the street completely. We were definitely in the street, but I don't think we had blocked it actually completely at that point. Okay. Um, I think they were more so blocking it than we were because they came out in such force. Um, and, you know, I just remember sitting there or standing actually at that point and I was like, you know, why are y'all doing this? What's going on? Why are you moving in with these batons and these shields? And then right after that, I was shot by a pepper bullet and then I was shot again by a pepper bullet. And then, you know, everyone started swarming in kind of and um, Tala or Talisha was actually not too far from me. And I was like, hey, hand me some milk, because at this point, my eyes like have tear gas all in them. I can't see. I'm breathe I'm like, you know, I'm trying to get the the tear gas out of my face. And if she's handing me milk, they just start shooting at her. And then they all just rush us to where we had to run. And it was just like it was it was something that I never thought I would experience. It's just we were met with aggression. Um, we were peaceful. And we were met with aggression. And I think that comes from a lack of training because I, nobody down there, if you actually saw like what was going on, you had one line of officers who were doing one thing and then another line who were stepping back and then another line who started shooting. I don't think they were, I don't even think they knew what they were doing, honestly. So, so let me get this straight. From your vantage point, you were in the square. From your vantage point, there was nothing that you could observe that would have precipitated a police action that you just spoke about. Correct. There was nothing at all. It was peaceful protesting that was met with aggression from the police. How many times have you observed this? I mean, is this just an isolated incident or did you see more? Oh, no, this has happened multiple, multiple times. I have been front lines, like very, very, very direct front lines to where it was like me and like this close to a to a whole line of officers in full riot gear. And every time I had been down there multiple times, I'd seen it in, you know, live streamers have captured it. Even if I wasn't there personally, I would see it on the live streaming of what's happening right there. Same tactics. Peaceful protesters met with aggression. Um, and it's not just mild aggression. It's like full force, pepper bullets, tear gas, mm -hmm. rushing, you know, pushing the shields against you. It's just, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. I agree. I'm going to like second what 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 uh, Delaney said. Um, for one, I think that like, what are police here to do? Like protect and serve, respond to crime, right? What I think that is a problem is that the police do not, they're not trained to, nor were they put in place to respond to trauma. So a lot of the crime that happens, a lot of this quote unquote violence that happens, a lot of this aggression that happens on the end of black folks is a response to trauma. And the police are not trained to respond to trauma. And also the police are fearful of black people in black bodies. And that's just the gist of it, they're racist. It's a whole system that was created for merely because of racism and enslavement. So when we think about 
it's not the fact that we want we don't want our neighborhoods to be policed for one black people police black people okay we and we can do that we can in the way that we police people has a lot of the way to a lot of the ways that we have policed each other has been um, embedded with white supremacy because of what we think we know or what we think is good or what we think works best for us. But if we demand, for one, that whole system has to be dismantled because the foundation is, 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 is sour. You know what I mean? The foundation is bad. When I think about the houses in the West End, the foundation is so good that it doesn't matter that it looks a mess. The foundation is 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 solid. The foundation is real good. So we can we can clean up this house and make it really really good, and we can paint over it, and we can get all the bugs and stuff out. But the foundation is solid. But when you think about the foundation of the police department, it is not solid. It is sour, and it was created to to do exactly what it is doing today. So that's why it has to be dismantled because the foundation is already messed up. We can't do nothing good we can't make this a good uh, uh we can't make this good we can't have any positivity come from something where the foundation is already bad we have to kick so it you, down at the foundation so, so you're saying there has to be there has to be not only a quantitative there has to be a qualitative change in the way this is done because of how it started and it's just an extension of what it started with um i i, I hear you what do you think charlise I agree. Um, I often wonder if any of these officers are trained to know how to even de-escalate small situations. I feel like it's always a heightened when they come out that it's a really, really bad situation going on. What happened in their training? Do they have the training to even how to handle large crowds um, of people who are peacefully protesting? Um, and even in simple, if they were to do that more aggressively, maybe they could handle people differently um, out there. You can even tell the difference in some of the officers that I've seen in, in the times I've been out there. There are some who don't want to be out there, who actually are agreeing to why we're out there. So you have that challenge, right? Um, so it, it's it's multi-layered with, with the police department and what they can do. But I think, you know, overall their approach to the protesting is just, it's been completely, it's been terrible. And not just in this instance, I think it's been that way with LMPD, how they have approached protesting, everything I feel like in their mindset, is not a riot. Everything is not a riot. We're not here to tear up things or break things. It's not a riot. So why do you have that mindset going in that it is a riot? When you have that the mindset. Over, the overreacting piece yeah. of it. I, you know, you know the, um, what I, what I call it was a sit down protest at Attorney Gem, General Cameron's home from all indications, and believe me, I went behind it to get some information, it was peaceful, yet the police turned that into, they escalated because they were in a position of power. You know, if you're in a position of power, it doesn't mean you use it, use wisdom. And, you know, turn a peaceful what in my day we would call it a civil rights sit-in <laughs> that's what we would have called that exactly into a felony mm -hmm. i think it's, it's extraordinary. inexplicable to me extraordinary to me I, i'm just glad that the uh county attorney o'connell had sense enough um to recognize, you know, you don't go down a road. And even though he said there was probable cause, of course. Now, I've been a, I've been a trained attorney myself uh, since 1975. I don't think there was any probable cause for a felony in that situation. But he was diplomatic about it. Give the police some room too when he backs up off of that. But that was ridiculous. That to me seemed like an example of what you all just got through talking about in terms of, you know. You got the power, and because someone crosses a line, that you use that power. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Kelly, I mean, yeah, Ellie? essentially. I mean, essentially, what I think of it is when you take um, when you take the group of white protesters that were outside of the governor's house, that were outside of Governor Bashir's house, in this line, hanging, hanging, a, hanging a doll of him from a noose on a tree. That's something that was much more violent than what happened at the attorney general's house, but it was responded to with much more understanding and much more peace. 
Mm. I think that I think that's a big issue. It's like just as Talisha said, our melanin is weaponized, and my skin tone, the fact that my skin is a little bit darker than the average person, it's weaponized against me on a daily basis. A lot of times, the melanin on a person's skin is a lot more dangerous than a gun, at least when it comes to perception. And that just goes to showing situations like that. In a situation where white people are protesting, or they're just fighting for something they believe in, which is reopening the economy and putting people at risk in the midst of a public health pandemic and a public health crisis. But when you take people fighting for the right to exist, and you take that as a riot, you take people fighting for the right to even exist, and you take that as aggression, and you take that as hostility and violence, that just goes to show that just goes to show that you don't even, um, that just goes to show the prejudice and the racism. Like as Talisha said, the foundation itself is shaky. In my opinion, there is no foundation. From the eyes of somebody in the police force, the foundation is strong, but that's because they do what they're supposed to do. They do exactly what they're supposed to do and that's oppress black people. Like the foundation of the police force is black oppression. It was originally meant to oppress people pre-Civil War. Then after that, it turned into a method of catching slaves and uh, voter suppression. Yes. Like when you take all those types of things into account and it evolved into what it is today, but take that foundation from the pre from pre-Civil War, from 1860, from six, 1865 to 77, the Reconstruction era, the uh inception of the Ku Klux Klan and the protection that they received from the police, the fact that many people in the Ku Klux Klan were and even are today members of the police forces all across this nation. You know, it's just like it's hard to say something is broken when it's doing exactly what it's intended to do. Yeah. And the thing is, and the thing is we're standing up. You know, the thing is, like, we weren't even written into the Constitution. We weren't written, written into the Declaration of Independence. So uh, at, the, at the foundation of this nation, we have no rights to protect. So it's just like, well, we're, we were amended into it. We were simply written in as a as an add-on rather than being built into the foundation. Not just they deserve freedom. It's white men deserve freedom. Later on, I guess they do too. So that just goes to show that all throughout the history of this nation, Black people have been an afterthought. Black people have been looked at as not even human. We have been, we have been looked at as inhumane for centuries. And it's just like now we're fighting, we're fighting for our right to even exist and our right to be just live free, abundant lives. And that's that's simply what it is. It's um when you look at the way that different protesters are responded to, it just go, it just goes and directly correlates to the foundation of this nation, the foundation of the police force, and that's to protect white people and oppress black people. And that's exactly what you see. And what I'm what I'm what I'm hearing from what you're saying is if you mix these two, you're getting into the reality of systemic racism and structural racism and the culture that it acts out through and how it's uh, uh, acted out. And, and, and I see that, I think I can agree exactly. And I think there's much documentation to support that. Uh, but even though we recognize that and let's accept those as facts, the reality is you're out there, it seems to me to make a better world. You're, you're not protesting to make a lesser world. You, you're protesting to eliminate injustices. But, but does voting have any place in this? Absolutely. So, isn't that what John Lewis was about? Isn't voting? Where does voting fit into this? I understand the protests. I got that. Where does voting? Doesn't that seem central to something that we have to do here? And I'm talking about voting participation. I'm talking about young people. I'm talking about you. I bet every, I bet all three, I bet all of you, all five of you, I bet all of you vote. I, I'll take a chance on that. I bet that. But I also bet that you can find a ton of young folk. And let me add something, a ton of old folk, or older folk that do not vote on a routine and informed basis. So what are you going to do about that? I think um, that, go ahead, Adia, my bad. I was just going to say, um, I think there's several factors into why people may not vote, one being voter suppression, <clears throat> so it's not always easy. Educationally speaking, Black communities are equipped with the necessary resources to be able to make educated decisions when it comes to politics or government, things like that. So I think that's something that's very important to emphasize. Secondly, it's also hard for some people to want to participate in a system that was literally built against them and not for them or by them. And so I guess it depends on the perspective you take. Personally, I vote and I encourage others to vote and I think it's important, absolutely. But for some people, they take the perspective that you're voting in a flawed system anyways. The system itself is flawed and needs to be dismantled. And so it's hard to want to participate in something that seems as though no matter how much you participate or no matter how much you push for certain changes, there's things that 
can't be fixed without dismantling the entire system. But on the other hand, I do think it's important that young people, any people, all people vote. Um, I think it's important to educate people with the necessary resources, the tools, and the education to vote um, intellectually and to vote, you know, with the right things in mind. I think it's obviously important because I think there's a need for both legislation, legislative and policy change, as well as like activism and physical changes community. So I think frontline people are necessary just as much as people who are doing policy work are necessary. So let me, so I, let me jump in there. Let me jump in there, Dia, and excuse uh, me for that. So okay. here's what I'm hearing, and I think you will agree with me. I'm going to take a big leap here. Look, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think At protest all, no. is necessary. I think protest brings change. I think history proves that. So what you're yeah. doing now brings change. But I also think a system might not be a perfect system. And I, I will challenge you and I will say there will not ever be a perfect system. Oh, but yeah. I do say that voting, if there is a system called a democracy that is imperfect, that voting is central to that, I don't see them mutually exclusive. Does that not give a responsibility for those of you and me to talk to our affected people, or people who are disillusioned, or people who feel they don't it absolutely does. Yeah, that those... they must do it? Because aren't they also contributing to lessen our ability to advance as well? You're hundred percent right. Well, go ahead, tell me. So I apologize. No, you good. Um, I don't necessarily. I don't know. Um, I've had a if and I'm kind of off and on on that. So yes, I vote and I voted and I know how to fight for my vote. I know I went down there and they told me that I was, um, they, I went down there and they told me that I uh, was, was not able to vote because I was not um, registered for Democrat or Republic. And I know that I changed that. Um, but again, I also have been in spaces where in spaces where um, people have told me what to do if that happens. I also am not working at my job right now. So I had the time and I had the time and the energy to sit right there and argue back and forth with them and be on the phone with them while they're calling people and telling me, no, I can't vote and me challenging them and going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for 30 minutes. I have the ability and the knowledge and the willpower and the accessibility to do that. A lot of people do not, and a lot of people would walk away from that, or would have walked away from that. So while Talisha. I think that voting is so important, Talisha. and I understand the history behind it, Talisha. I also, yeah, I got, I got to cut in here. You, you just gave, you just gave the quintessential example of a person who understands that she has a right, and she's not going to be denied it. You fought for that right. That 30 minutes that you argued, and that, that was a fight. You was fighting yes. for that right. I mean, it's not like somebody's going to give it to you. We know people out here suppressing it. We know yeah. since the beginning they tried to take it away from it. My question to you and to the rest of you is, shouldn't that at some point or in some way in your activities, I'm not just talking about you. I'm just talking about folks who protest, folks who are concerned, not you personally necessarily, Shouldn't we also incorporate that as part of what we're doing to try to, as they say, make a more perfect union? I think I agree. <laughs> I, I see what you're saying, but at the same time, uh, take keep saying but. Y'all keep saying but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hear me out. Hear me out, though. What I'm okay. saying is, I think I think it has been an essential part. I I think what you're saying is, I think something that everybody on this call sees. For example, when you take all the protests that have been going on downtown at Susan Jefferson. There's been voter registration tables all the way up into the primaries. That's in the West, in the West, in the local, people are setting up voter registration tables on street corners, That's going true. door to door, just trying to register people. I know people that are doing that firsthand. So I think, I think the importance of the importance of voting is very well documented. But at the same time, take this past, take this past primary for example, the Charles Booker lost, and the amount of voter suppression that happened in the midst of a pandemic, the amount of uh, mail-in ballots and the amount of absentee ballots. So much could go wrong with that, and so much did. A lot of votes didn't even get accounted for. So, but like, don't you fight? Like, don't you then fight voter suppression? You do. You do. You do. You do but I think I. You do, but I think the emphasis is, the emphasis is a lot bigger than just voting. The bigger emphasis is that, regardless of who we vote for, a lot of times when you put somebody when you put somebody with good intentions into a flawed system, it's hard for them to execute what they want to execute when they're an anomaly. When you're an anomaly, when you're when you're a great person. 
but you're an anomaly in a flawed system, it's hard for you to do what you want to do because you can easily get outvoted. It's easier, it's easier for people to overpower and silence your voice when you're an anomaly. So, so like, what do you do? Like so what, do you, what do you do? Just roll over and quit? Or do you don't, you, but you, you don't, don't, you don't, but there, you don't, but there's so many, you don't, but there's so many other different fights. You didn't answer that's the question. point. That's the point of that's the you point. That's the question. point. I said, do you roll over or do you engage and fight for it? You engage and fight, but what does the fight look like? That fight doesn't just, but that, what I'm saying is the fight is much bigger than just go out and vote. Fight for your right I agree to vote. with that. I agree and that's, with that. And that's, and, that's, and that's the point. And I think that's the point that Talisa was making as well. Yeah. That, that exactly. vote is very, that vote is very important, but not everybody's equipped. Not everybody's equipped with the uh with the with the knowledge. Not everybody has the financial situation where they can sit there and argue for 30 minutes about But do we right agree? Do we agree that we fight for it? Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I want to yeah. know. And and but I was going to I get, I get add your point cuz I think we're saying the same thing. I really do. Yeah. I think we're saying the same thing. It is bigger. It's it's more than voting. If it wasn't more than voting, we wouldn't be out there trying from day to day survive uh on something that voting hasn't caught up with in terms of giving people access and, and the ability to, to eat and, and have respect in the community, to be protected, so forth. I agree with you totally. But it does involve voting, and I think it's core as well. I think you agree with that. It's yeah. somebody else's opinion. I was, I, Go ahead. I'm not bad. Go ahead, Sean. No, I was just going to say, um, I definitely agree that it involves voting. Um, you know, well, you all may know, yeah, um, Urban League is... I'm sorry, Urban League is big on voting. Uh, we actually have several voting initiatives in the NAACP we work with. I know I work with people as well. I wanted to say this to tie in along with voting. I think it's important too that like people like myself and our peers prepare ourselves to be in places to make those changes. What I say, what I mean by that is deciding to run for positions of Metro Council or for Senate if we're gonna to wanna to make the change, then we have to be in those places and seats and not just say, hey guys, go vote. We gotta then step up and take the accountability to be a voice for the voiceless. Let That's me let me say. let me say this to you all. The time went too fast for me. This went entirely too fast. You 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 guys, let me tell you something. You, you you've made your point to me. And I dare say you've made it to the listening audience here. It, it was so insightful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to ask you all to come back periodically. The same configuration right here. And let's make some observations together as we move forward. Would you all agree to do that with me? Would you do that? Yep, because I'll be there. I, I, yes, I'm I'm there. Sir, be honored to. I think, I think we have something to say. So I want to at this time, on behalf of Straight Talk and myself personally, Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts, these candid thoughts. You, you, you're on the front line. You, you, I cannot tell you how much support you have that you don't know in terms of people I'm talking to every single day. Stay strong, stay out there, and God bless you so very much. So at this time, I want to give something that I think we all is very important, and that's a tribute uh, to John Lewis. John Robert Lewis, a son of a sharecropper from Troy, Alabama, rose to be the symbol of the civil rights movement because of his courage and commitment to the cause of freedom and justice. He passed from this life, July 17, 2020. As a young boy, inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., decided then to join the civil rights movement and quickly gained national prominence at a young age as one of the big six who organized and spoke at the 1963 March on Washington, which crystallized the nation in the fight for human dignity and civil rights. Despite more than 40 arrests, physical attacks and serious injuries, John Lewis remained a humble, devoted advocate of the philosophy of nonviolence, always at the front, fearlessly leading direct action protests, such as the student sit-ins in Nashville, Tennessee in the 60s, the freedom rides into the violently deep racist South, the symbolic march across the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, that left him injured as a victim of a brutal attack. This didn't stop him. It fueled his commitment. He never quit to his dying day. As an Atlanta city councilman to his long term in the United States Congress, he never wavered from his commitment to the cause. At the heart of this activism was always securing the right to vote. He championed and encouraged all to exercise the right. 
even in the continuing un-American efforts of those to limit access to that franchise. In short, he challenged America to live up to its promise, equality and justice for all. John Robert Lewis, leader, champion for civil, voter and human rights. My friend, your friend, our friend, lives on through the protesters of today. Uncompromising, courageous, unrelenting, knowing that injustice cannot stand, must not stand. The protest of today against police brutality and racial injustice is a living tribute to this American icon, this American hero. The struggle continues. From Straight Talk, thank you for joining us today. And as I always say, do the right thing. God bless you.